To my immediate left, we have IFBB pro Frank McGrath. Great pro bodybuilder, and one thing cool about Frank that uh, I always think about, if you go online, like on some of the forums and stuff, you see that most of the guys online, they all rather look like Frank than Mr. Olympia. It was a big threat on bodybuilding.com when Jay Cutler won the Olympia, and, and this is not a knock on Jay at all because he's a great guy, but the guys, who, they want to emulate Frank's physique more than Mr. Olympia. And that says a lot. That resonates a lot. He is a great bodybuilder, but more than that, people want to you know, emulate him and look like him. So that's pretty cool. I didn't say that. <laughs> to his left, we have one of the best powerlifters in the world. Brandon is one of the top ranked powerlifters in the world. Brandon Lilly from Kentucky. He's also uh, the creator of the Cube Method. Right? And then to his immediate, uh, not his immediate left, I'm sorry. We have a translator with us. And uh, we have Andre Milanichev. Andre comes all the way from Moscow, if you don't know who he is. He has the highest total in the world for raw, uh, he, uh, raw lifting. He just got a few weeks ago at Raw Unity. Um, he does not speak English, but we do have a translator here. And uh, he's a great guy, so we're going to have the opportunity to ask him some questions. I'm going to get the discussion started, kind of like we did with the first group. And uh, I'm going to ask the three of you guys to talk about the similarities between powerlifting and bodybuilding as far as training goes, nutrition, and how they kind of intertwine. So we'll start out with, uh, with Frank. Um, I think, like, I, I incorporate some powerlifting. Well, I don't want to say powerlifting. I, the same movements in my training. I mean, I started doing deadlifts. I've always done squats. And, you know, I've always done bench. So I think it, it's always important to do the basic movements, you know, for powerlifting or bodybuilding, you know, to build the foundation and stuff. Um, Diet-wise, um, you know, I see a lot of powerlifters today that are like, you know, pretty, really in good shape. So it makes me feel like these guys must be on a good diet as well. Like, um, I see a few guys at the cage the other day that are like really pretty lean. Like, yeah, like Al. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, you don't always have to be out of shape to be a powerlifter. Like everyone thinks like, if I'm going to be a powerlifter, I had to be out of shape or whatever. And I, I don't think that's, you know, I, do, I don't think you need to be like ripped, but... Um, to be, you can still look good and be a powerlifter, you know, so I think the diet can, you know, doesn't have to be crazy, you know, to eat tons of, you know, bad food and stuff, so I think it can be somewhat the same as, power, as bodybuilding. Um, you know, for me, I, I kind of happened into the sport uh, because of my uncle, well, he's an uncle by marriage, and his brother, um, they were both into bodybuilding, they were both into powerlifting, and they had a lot of the old muscle and strength, muscular development, um, flex magazines, you know, 80s, 70s and 80s and stuff like that. So my introduction was never, you're either a powerlifter or you're a bodybuilder, you're just, you're going to the gym to be as strong and as jacked as possible. And, um, you know, that was the thing, I, like, immediately fell in love with uh, the physique, like Bill Kazmaier, uh, Doug Young, those two guys just stood out to me, probably because they were featured a lot in the magazines that my uncles gave me. Um, not, not really because I knew anything about them. It was just they had about six magazines that they gave me, and those two guys stood out. And then I started. I'll never forget it. The first, uh, the first magazine I bought was a it was a Muscle and Fitness, and it had a, it was a turquoise cover. It had Jay Cutler on the front. It was uh, July of two, July of ninety nine. It was actually when I started working out. And um, that led into a Flex magazine, and that's when I started seeing the animal ads. <laughs> and I've told Frank this, and it, uh, I'm not ashamed of it. You know, whenever I, I got one of those portfolio journals, um, you know, I, I had a picture of him cut out with a, a saying underneath it um, from Teddy Roosevelt. You know, it's, it's not the critic that counts. I had that taped under the, the picture of Frank um, kind of looking down with the, the bill down low. And that was my motivation. You know, I trained at a really awesome gym. It was called Total Fitness. It was it was in a strip mall beside a Total Fitness. It was I mean beside a Domino's Pizza. It was um, it was like a prison style training system. It was whoever got there first dictated what everybody did that day. Um, we had about 40 members, lots of guys benching in the four and five hundreds, um, lots of guys pulling in the five and six hundreds, and lots of guys you know squatting in the five to six hundred range and prided themselves on the competition aspect of going to the gym. So I didn't know, 
how distinct a lot of people drew the line between powerlifting and bodybuilding. You know, like on the internet, you would think it's it's like black and white, cut and dry. But for me, I was always brought up, you know, like I looked at Arnold, he did both. I looked at Franco Colombo, he did both. Ken Wheeler, he did both. Robbie Robinson, he did both. You know, those guys were guys that I admired, and those are guys that I wanted to be like, you know, that lifestyle that, you know, just being as strong as you possibly could because in the gym that I trained in, you know, if we were doing bench one day, it may not be flat bench. It may be, okay, we're going to take the 110s and you're going to do as many reps as you can. And we're going to see who does the most reps. So it was very much, um, you were always on point. You always had to be strong. And I think that developed a lot of the mentality that I still carry today, you know, being able to try to do things on demand, not really going in and saying it's a dedicated chest day. So I'm just going to do chest. You know, if, if my back feels good, I'll do back. If my legs feel good, I'll squat, you know, things like that. And um, I know I got a little bit off topic, but I just think, I think the sport could thrive a lot more. I mean, Frank and I talk a lot and, uh, you know, we share training ideas and whatnot and we get along great. You know, he's given me some good ideas. I hope that I've given him some good ideas. The two blend a lot better than, than you would think. I mean, you talk about one of the greatest, I think, lifters you just you just call him a lifter is uh, Ronnie Coleman you know as, as strong as he was he still developed a Mr. Olympia physique you know so it can be done with heavy compound movements um, yeah you know it's just uh, I think we need to stop separating them so much and I think that's what animals done a really good job of is, is showing you know you got guys like Dan Green Sam Bird um, Jay Nera Cade Weber guys that look like they're you know eight to ten weeks out from a bodybuilding show showcasing that you don't have to be the typical you know mindset of the 90s power lifter where you're just fat sloppy and bloated um you can actually hold a good physique and, and still be super super strong don't want to repeat the question okay uh have you talked about the similarities between bodybuilding and power we all lift weights we all lift weights. I think press, squat, and deadlift are the three most important exercises, and they're used everywhere. They're used by bodybuilders and powerlifters both. Okay. That's it. That's cool. <laughs> Andre's short and sweet, but the words that he say, says is true. Yeah. He was a good bodybuilder. I didn't know that. Andre was a bodybuilder? 18. I was younger. <laughs> I was 14. And I started doing it by accident. <laughs> I didn't have an uh, athletic center to go to. We created something out of uh, pieces of uh, metal, just like a weight to lift. Mm -hmm. made, it something, made something out of wood to do some exercises to. Mm -hmm. May use bricks to make weights too. After that, I found a, a real center I could go to where I would practice and I would go to different championships and competitions. One time I got a call from National Geographic. They wanted me to show them where I started when I started working out and training. It was in 2000. 
I told them I started in the basement of some building where it's so dirty you wouldn't want to go there. <laughs> they said, no, we want to see it. That's what we want to see. They actually came with a crew to shoot it, to make it, with, a, with an interpreter. I actually took them there to see that basement where I started. They were shocked. They said, wow. <laughs> they went back to the uh, car. <laughs> they had all the equipment they wanted to shoot. They wanted, they brought all the lights. They wanted to, you know, really videotape it. But the basement was a really, you know, typical Russian basement. One little light bulb on the uh, ceiling. I actually had to go to some uh, construction site and I stole two buckets of paint just to paint the walls. I didn't have any other resources. I don't know what kind of paint because you still can smell it, you know, if you walk into that basement. <laughs> I guess it's taken a while to dry. <laughs> <laughs> they actually came to look at it and they couldn't believe that that's where I started, that's where the origin, my origin came from. Mm -hmm. I actually, uh, I told them, I said, well, these are the bricks I used as hand weights and, you know, this I used for this exercise. And then um, they were impressed because they saw Arnold's posters everywhere. I actually had gotten one and then I made a lot of copies just, you know, just to be uh, motivated. I put all over the place. And honestly, when I started, we didn't really have uh, much there. We didn't have any magazines to get motivated. We didn't have protein to keep eating to build the muscles. I think I was 17 the first time I tried protein. I guess at that time, you know, some of my friends' parents would travel overseas, bring some magazines back, and I saw those different ads for different protein mixes. And I would, I remember, I would sit down and I sit and dream about how those mixtures taste. I, I had no idea. <laughs> then one time, a friend of mine came by and he said, "Hey, I've had found some of the." Pills they give dogs to help them grow, and we try those too. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't taste good. <laughs> but we tried those, we ate those. <laughs> I remember I had an overpowering desire just to keep training, to, to win. You know, I was so excited, I was ready to sleep there. I just wanted to spend all my time at the basement. So actually when they came to uh, videotape the basement, they were so impressed and they left the uh, lighting system that they had brought with them to uh, videotape, they left it for us and I was very thankful. It is an incredible thing because it widens your horizons. It allows you to meet different people. And I'm very thankful to Animal in particular because they gave me an opportunity to meet so many incredible people, to experience so many different things, to be part of such incredible events like this one. And I remember how it felt when I uh, tried the Animal Pack for the first time. I do remember. 
98 год, они были тогда еще как бы на, на упаковках, не так, как сейчас. And it was 1998, they were still at that time being distributed in, in uh, paper boxes. Вот эта линза Animal, она очень популярна в России, мне здесь понравилась. And Animal has been very popular in Russia uh, the whole time, and I uh, like it very much in particular. Поэтому Арнольд Шварценеггер, он как раз был вдохновительным вообще для всех. Мы смотрели фильмы его, в общем, это было что-то невероятное. At the time I was growing up, Arnold was such an inspiration for all of us. I remember we would just watch movies where he was um, part of. It was just incredible to watch him, to want to be like him. И тогда еще, будучи маленьким мальчиком, я не знал, что я смогу себя фотографировать. As a little boy, I mean, I had no idea I would be able to be in a picture with him. I was very happy. And Ed Cohen has always been a, um, someone to look up to in powerlifting. He, was, he, he lived ahead of his times. And he has done incredible work in this particular area. And he's always been an inspiration for me. And uh, my dream is to try to um, get as much done as possible in my lifetime. I'd like to take this opportunity and thank Animal for everything that they ha have done for me, for the opportunities they've given me, for allowing me to meet so many different incredible people. Thank you. I know uh, Andre had a good moment on Friday because uh, Arnold came by the cage and he got to meet Arnold and he was pretty pumped about that. There was a table there so I had to move it. <laughs> so when he came up, uh, he was standing there, there were people to the right of him and there was a desk to the left of him and he said you can go beyond the desk. And the people were to his right. But there was no one other than the desk. And I came and started moving the desk. <laughs> and the, he, the, the desk wasn't moving that far. And somebody started yelling, hey, they can't see him behind you. So I just grabbed him like that. <laughs> and they said, you can't do that. I said, doesn't matter, I do, I want to. That was pretty cool. And I don't know if it was last year or the year before, but um, Arnold usually comes, he comes to the cage every year, takes a quick picture with us, and it's like real fast stuff. So you're not there at that exact moment, it's gone. But one year, he did stop. He wanted to check out Frank's forearms. No kidding. He asked him to flex his forearms, and Arnold's son was there, and he wanted to show him the forearms, too. So that was pretty cool. All right. Um, we want to give you guys a chance to ask these guys questions. So we're going to open it up. If you guys can just speak up loudly um, and tell us you know, which athlete you have the question for. You guys can, can begin. Raise, raise your hands. We'll pick somebody. I have plenty of questions, but if you guys want to. Um, Justin Martin, uh, question for Brandon Lilly. Um, we know, I know you're coming off a big injury and everything like that, man. Um, you know, how, how have that been, you know, mentally for you coming back that? You know, for a lot of people, they made it out that you have to be able to walk after, you know, as bad as it was. Well, believe it or not, um, you know, it was actually, uh, it was pretty overwhelming, the response that I got from people. Um, you know, positive, saying, you know, hey, we're pulling for you, you know. We're, we're hoping that you'll get back. We're hoping that you'll, uh, that you'll get better. And then, um, you know, it was about day three or four. I don't remember exactly. I, it, I guess it was day four because I had a second surgery on my left leg on day three. And um, it was just one of those days I was really feeling sorry for myself. You know, I'd been in a bed, unable to move, and I remember waking up every single morning, and it was like, man, I just – it was a terrible dream, and then you got to move your legs, and they just don't move. And um, I remember laying there, and I ended up getting a message from a guy from Facebook. He, he messages me from time to time, and 
I know his story and, and know a little bit about him, but he sent me a message and uh, it pretty much hit me in the face. He said, 20 years ago I was in a car accident and I lost complete use of my legs. And he said, you know what, the best thing about my day is waking up in the morning. He said, because that instant when I wake up and when I try to move my foot, he said, I believe I can move it. And he said, for 20 years I've never lost the belief that I can move a toe. And he said, if I can move one toe, I can move mountains. And he said, so consider yourself lucky. And that was all I needed. You know, it was, um, I am lucky. You know, um, I'm very thankful for what I've done as far as a lifter and powerlifting. But at the same time, uh, if I could never lift again, I still have the ability to, to play a sport with, or to, you know, throw baseball with my son or to take a walk with, with my wife or, you know, to, to do just everyday things. And I think that's what this whole experience for me has done is it's magnified the everyday events, you know, the things that you take for granted, um, going up and down stairs without sidewalking, um, you know, getting in and out of a car without, like, having to do a gymnastics maneuver, things like that. But um, for sure, it's, it's definitely made the gym – I mean, it, going into the gym for me has always been an important thing. But February 12th uh, was my first day back. And that was probably the single greatest feeling as far as a gym related. Better than any powerlifting moment. Better than pulling that 815 at Capo. Better than anything was going back into the gym with a group of people that I know that, that truly love me. You know, it's like my, my teammates are awesome. They're like brothers. And um, getting that feeling back of just being in a place that, you, that you're comfortable with, that you know, that took away any doubt that I was done. You know what I mean? Not even if I, I, I may never squat 100 pounds again, ever. But um, the reality is I'm not done. Like, I can do so many different things in the gym. It's just taking advantage of what you can do and appreciating what you can do. Um, Frank's been awesome, <clears throat> as you know. You know, Frank had his had his accident and uh, went through a lot of struggles. I don't know how many times I've watched Wrath Returns. I mean, you know, and Frank's always been one of those guys that just as, just as it seems like the confidence is starting to wane a little bit, you know, um, maybe you're getting down, like, God, you're getting frustrated. Frank will pop up with a text message, how you doing, buddy? You know, I've been there. You're doing great. You know, you're walking it three weeks and I remember sitting in the hospital bed for three months you know things like that and when you got a guy to me I, like Frank was just like you know up here like a celebrity if you you know for, for all intents and purposes and uh, he's taking he's taking two minutes out of his day to send me a text message to say you know what I've been there I'm thinking about you you're gonna be fine you know and then uh, Andre you know I was in Andre's room the other night and he looks at you and he says, "You know what? Recovery's here." He said, "It's not in your it's not in your legs. It's here." He said, "You can, you will." He said, "Believe you can, you will." And um, I've I've never had those down moments since day four, but it's you know every time every now and then something will be hard, something will be harder than it should be, and it's like, damn it, you know this why me? But overall, it's it's changed my whole perspective on life so, so much more for the better. I think I'll be a better lifter for it. I think I'll be a better coach for it. Um, I, I think I'm a better. I think I'm a better man because of it. So I'm very, very thankful for that. That I was injured. Honestly, it, it changed everything. Next question. I have a question for Andre Malaysia. Yes, please speak <laughs> Andre, you have performed, you have uh, taken part in various um, championship, world championship at different other cups, uh, other events all over the world. Uh, 
what do you have about organizational part of this particular event? And I also think that if we were able to um, air it directly, if we could, could do it online, that I, I'm sure there were a lot of um, fans of yours would have been able to watch you live and participate and take part in all these events. I think that would have helped a lot too. What do you think? I uh, took part in different events at IPF, uh, IPF. IPF Federation events, and I have I achieved a lot in the course of those ten years. Я считаю, что это самая убогая организация, которая только может быть. IPF я имею в виду. And I think IPF is one of the uh, weakest organizations out there that uh, existed. Я никогда не забуду одного момента здесь в Майами. I remember there was an um, uh, incident in Miami here in the United States. Gaston Parashu, president of the Federation, Gaston Parashev. I remember he got a, a post of Kirk Harvoski. Um, I wanted to remind you, he was one of the first people who was able to squat 450. One, either the first one or one of the first ones. And the guy says, who is this person? Is he a hockey player? <laughs> they said, yeah, he's a hockey player. <laughs> So I think that people, part of the federation, don't really know much about the um, the industry, the, the market. They have uh, bans all the time, some kind of repression. So I think the whole approach to athletes that they take is, is not right. I've always been struck by how they treated real athletes. In, the, in Australia and in the US, uh, championships are organized completely different. They don't have, they don't set as many limitations here. If you want to approach something, you know, a certain weight for the fourth time, they will let you, as long as you're willing, as long as you want to. And you can participate whether you're wearing wraps or not, and it's up to you. And no one's going to disqualify you for that. Здесь гораздо свободнее, и люди, которые приходят сюда, зрители, они очень благодарны тебе, когда ты поднимаешь килограмм. We have freedom here, and audience, people who come to watch you, they are sincerely grateful to you for lifting those weights. Вот вчера было невероятно просто, вот это вот ажиотаж, невероятно просто. I felt incredible yesterday, all that attention, all that energy. Я говорю абсолютно честно. And I'm very sincere because I have other um, events that I was part of I can compare. So to me, any events that are organized in the U.S. and Australia are the best of the best. Everything is so well organized, everything is so professional. If you have a certain weight that's, let's say, 25 um, kilos, you know, you know the weight ahead of time. I mean, you're not, you, you don't start swaying because of a particular weight, so you're prepared better. Mm -hmm. Texas grief. Texas grief and it's easier to hold. It's much easier to hold. 
очень оригинальная и очень такая позитивная. So just the whole atmosphere of all these events is very original, it's very positive. Я выступал сейчас во Флориде. I was um, taking part in the um, event in Florida. И вот я с Мишей приехал, он мне помогал. I came with Misha who was helping me. Но мы бы не справились вдвоем, потому что ну, невозможно справиться вдвоем. But we would not have been able to do what we did if we were just two of us. Присоединился Сэм. Сэм came to help us. Остальные спортсмены из Animal. And the rest of the athletes from Animal came to assist. Люди пришли, которые даже не в Animal состоялись. И все помогали. There were people who were just not even part of Animal, people who were there to help, and all of them, you know, were there to assist me. To me, this kind of help from people who don't even know me or I don't know is incredible. I remember I was part of a um, championship in Moscow. I remember I asked a female to help me uh, uh, wrap a wrap around my uh, arm. I'm sorry, no, I, I came to help her because someone said, well, help her put a wrap around her arm. So anyway, uh, to make the sh uh, long story short, they just kicked, almost kicked me out of the um, auditorium because I said, well, you're part of a different federation, you can't do that. <laughs> To me, it's just something um, out of ordinary. How would things change if I was there to help her put a wrap around her arm? And I remember that was the part of the Federation I was for 10 years. That's the attitude. Here we don't have something like this. People are very supportive, very, very helpful here, and I think um, these type, kind of events are very um, inducive to lifting weights. I think European way of approaching these championships um, is not very professional. Я вот приехал в Финляндию, например, да? I remember I was in Finland. Я спросил у организаторов, какой будет гриф. I asked the uh, people who were organizing about the grief, what kind of grief there was going to be. Для приседаний. Просто 25 килограмм или обычный? For squats, whether it's going to be um, 25 kilos or whether it's going to be regular. Мне говорят, а, а, какой выберешь, такой будет. Я говорю, мне тогда вот 25 килограмм. They said, well, it's up to you. And I said, well, let's, I'm, I'm going to choose 25 kilos. Because when you have a big weight, you have a very big difference. This weight will not hold you. It starts to be 10 or 10. Because uh, in my opinion, uh, if the grip is heavy, it's easier to lift. Because if it's thin or uh, doesn't weigh as much, then you start shaking. It's hard for you to lift. I came to the championship. So I came to the championship. And I said, hey, we changed our mind. You can use the grief we had told you about. But I said, we talked about it. You said, yes. Then we talked about deadlift. I said, what kind of grief? Is it Texas or regular? I said, well, Texas. And I guess, you know, the, the way I train, is affected by what kind of grief it's going to be. So had they told me it's going to be regular, I would have been uh, tr training with regular. But they said, no, you can use Texas. And I was training using Texas. So then I, go to the, uh, I got to the championship and they said, hey, we changed our mind, you can use that. So we had to do a lot of negotiation. We actually uh, managed to uh, pull that off to do that. But the overall, the whole experience, you know, you get very disappointed. Here, something like this would not happen.
In my opinion, just from watching the popularity of Raw just rise significantly in the past year, and it just looks like the gear is going by the wayside, do you think that we're ever going to have a chance to have the caliber of meat, like, like back when Chuck, you know, in 2011 did his list, that there's that intensity, that stage, that, that presence for Raw lifting to where everybody is more of a unified body? I mean, I know that's something that you always talk about, Brandon, how Everybody, everybody's federation is different. You know, we just talked about it a few minutes ago. But will there ever be, can Raw Unity be the meet to compete at where everybody's trying to qualify for this meet? Or can it ever make it to the Arnold main stage? You know, will there be a lift or a meet for Raw lifters like the IPA world where, you know, when, when Chuck and people from West Side and Lexington and everybody were just you know, destroying it in popularity? Yeah. Well, in my opinion, is this money follows popularity. Okay, and it definitely seems that, at least for the moment, the, the the bright light or the shining light is on raw powerlifting. Taking nothing away from from geared lifting, I mean, it's it's really they're really two different specialties. You know what I mean? So, but I think more people can regularly relate to raw lifting for what it is, just because, you know. They're, they're, they're super freaks, like a, a Spoto or a Mendelssohn with a 700-pound bench. But a lot of guys are benching the 500, 600-pound range. And most guys in their gym class bench 200 pounds or something like that. So they have a correlation of what, that, what that's like. I think on a global scale, what you're seeing is you've got really dedicated, good-hearted, for-the-sport promoters. Wayne Hallett being one of them. Um, I was I was lucky enough to to be associated with him through Capo. Uh, you've got the the group of PTC and uh, Emod there in Australia, and uh, Andre could tell you the same thing. I mean, when you're down there, you're absolutely. I mean, for what a joke professional powerlifting is, or the term professional powerlifter is in the states, when you go to Australia, you're absolutely treated like a professional. Um, you know, to step off a plane in, in uh, Melbourne, I'm sorry, in uh, Tasmania, and for a news anchor to meet you there, you know, that's odd. And then to be shuttled down and you talk to a radio host, that's odd. And then whenever you go out to a restaurant, everything, we've got it, you know, that's odd. So it's going to take people <clears throat> who are willing to invest in the sport, you know, not try to put money necessarily in their pocket. Um, Animal has done that. Animal being, I think the first, well, I mean, other companies have dabbled, but I think Animal has taken the stand and said, look, we're behind powerlifting. So that's one. It's going to take others to step up and say, hey, we believe in powerlifting just as much as this. We're going to put some money in the sport. We're going to invest in the athletes. And it's going to take somebody with control. I mean, if you look at, at bodybuilding, and Frank could probably tell you this, you know, if it wasn't for the weeders, um, who would have directed it? You know what I mean? Like, they, they took the sport, maybe some good, some bad, but they guided it. You know, they set up a federation and they ran it. And they, they invested in it. That doesn't necessarily happen here because even within one federation, you've got 50 state chairs who all want to put money in their pocket. The creator of the federation wants to put money in his pocket. Some meats are good. Some meats are pure shit. Um, you know, and it just it's going to take somebody, somebody that's out there. If you're watching this video and you're out there and you love powerlifting, step up. You know, I mean, there's so many good people in the sport, and I think the sport could really become something um, worth watching and worth paying attention to. Oh yeah. Right, and and that's that's the other downfall is. Do you think we have that though? I mean, no, I mean, I mean, I'm saying there be, it can become a monopoly. You know what I mean? And that's that's the that's the other downfall is you can become ostracized. You know, like with the WBF came out, uh, Vince McMahon tried to do his thing, guys were blacklisted. But I mean, look. But if powerlifting could do that, at least everybody, it would be a, a, a total, yeah, whether it be 
you know, like where the IFBB are making money. Right. You know, where, where it'd be that if you're an amateur, right. and then when you get to the top powerlifting, you make legit money. Right. But you have to stay in these organizations. Right. So the best of the best would be in line. Yeah, I see what you're saying. What I was, what my, I guess my, and I've, I've spoken about this, my goal would be a four meet championship, okay? You have to compete in three of them. You know, you have one in, you know, Western Europe. You have one in Australia, Eastern Europe, America, South America, whatever. But you have four that you can go to that that globalize the sport a little bit, unify it. I think raw unity was a huge step. I think capo was the first step. I think raw unity was the second big step, where you're gathering a conglomerate of great, I mean, super talented lifters where you're going to see record after record after record chased or broken, and then you leave everybody with a positive, saying, you know what, I didn't get my lifts, but the judging was great. You know, it starts there, and I think you have to have those showcase events where everybody wants to be there, and then the amateurs will say, you know what, my dream is to get there. Just like with the animal cage. You know, I think I'm hearing a lot of younger lifters, they'll they'll message me on Facebook, how do I lift in the cage? How do I lift in the cage? What do I got to do to get in the cage? So Animal is starting those small baby steps right now, you know, and if it continue and Animal, you know, stays behind some of these meets, they got behind Capo, they got behind Rum, and people can say, you know what, Animal's doing good things for powerlifting, we're going to support Animal, and I'm all about that. If a company doesn't, if a company makes money off powerlifters, but doesn't invest in powerlifting, fuck them. That's what I say. And there are people that make a lot of money off powerlifting that don't put anything back. Fuck them. So, I never bought a pair of Reeboks in my life until they started supporting parking. Exactly. Never you know, in my life. I like, and I do, it, I do it specifically because of that. Because right. I see what they're doing. Right. And that's the thing is they're slowly, you get Reebok into powerlifting, animals into powerlifting. And that's what I'm saying. Trains start to chug. You know what I mean? We just, lifters have to keep going where the other lifters go. The problem is you'll have a, a championship in Chicago where the Little Bridges would lift. You have something in Tennessee where Sam might lift. You have something in Kentucky where I might lift on the same weekend. Two of us have got to confess or concede and say, I'm going where they're going just so I can be there. You know what I mean? I want to fly to California so I can compete with Dan Green or be on the same platform with Dan Green. I want to go to Washington so I can lift with a Ben C. Or lived in California with a Brent Willis, or go to Canada lift with Jay Nair, Cade Weber, things like that. Guys need to stick together. The top guys can make a lot of change. I mean, no, really, if they stick together. I mean, look at the waves that Westside has made when they've made decisions. Hey, we're not going to support this Fed anymore. Fed dies. You know what I mean? People will follow the top lifters. So, I think the top lifters have a responsibility to do that. I mean, but I think they should like decide amongst themselves. What federation you're going to stick with? I I totally agree with that. I, I mean I 100% agree with you. It's just a matter of almost having a board, but who's going to lead? Who's going to? You know the problem with with sports like powerlifting and bodybuilding, and, and I don't think I'm stepping on anybody's toes when I say this. They begin with insecurity. You know they're they're filled with insecurity. I mean I don't think anybody that feels good about themselves went to the gym to to look better. You know what I mean? We all have something inside of us that makes us want to punish our bodies. So everybody's going to have to maybe take take a step back and say, this is for the sport. It's not about me anymore. It's about the sport. And I think I think we're there. I mean, I think there's a good group of guys at the top, especially I'm more identified with the raw side now. I'm not I'm not in the in the world of the gear lifting as much anymore. So, you know, we got a pretty good group of representatives right here with Animal, and that's not to say there aren't other great lifters out there. But I mean, if we stand together and we do things right and we compete where we each other compete, Animal can definitely be a, 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 a starting point, you know, for bigger and better things, at least in my opinion. Next question, guys. We've got time for like one or two more. I got a really boring one after that. Okay. Brandon. Uh, we're starting, you, Brandon, you train in a, a gym that's kind of put together. Uh, people just pitch in and, and buy equipment as, as you got the, the cash for it or whatever. Um, our, ours is at the beginning. Uh, we got, you know, power rack and a deadlift platform and the, the bar is necessary and the weight. Uh, is there any foundational piece of equipment um, 
Like, like what, what's one that you think everybody should have that's not real expensive? I, you know, first and foremost, <clears throat> uh, this is a this is a shout out to a good friend of mine, father-in-law. Make friends with your welders. You know what I mean? Find a local welder and make friends with them yeah. because they can make a lot of shit for you. Um, but the thing about that is, too, you just need to, to look at what you're going to be doing. Okay, I've got a thousand bucks to spend. All right, I can get a $700 power rack that I can squat, pin pull, deadlift, bench press, everything out of. So I say you start with a power rack. Get a good power bar. There's your thousand bucks. I mean, I went on, um, was it Craigslist or Amazon? I don't remember. It was Amazon or Craigslist. And I pretty much pieced out a full dumbbell set of competition bench press, um, walkout racks, and a deadlift platform. I built everything for around $6,500. Anything you would ever need. Um, and that was even with uh, a brand new Mastodon bar, a 60 pound squat bar, and a brand new uh, deadlift bar and power bar. So you can build a lot with a little, especially if you start tapping into resources like welders, one on Craigslist, Amazon, call these gyms. Uh, there are guys that, that specialize, I won't say their name, but um, there are guys that actually, actually just specialize in buying wholesale stuff from closed down gyms. I mean, gyms, gyms are closing every day because these, you know, these commercial box gyms are coming in and taking over, and they've got this huge return policy on leased equipment. So there's, where does the equipment go? You know what I mean? Scrapyards or to guys that, that buy it at wholesale. There's tons of resources out there. you just got to find them. And uh, being where you are, there's one in Tennessee that you'd probably be really good at looking into. Um, that's where we get a lot of our stuff from. I mean, we got a we got a. Twelve hundred and fifty dollar uh, Nautilus leg extension, which is amazing, for four hundred dollars. Um, it's just being patient. It's just putting together what you need, you know, first, and then getting the accessory stuff later. Um, but like I said, I would start with a power rack. I was. We've, we've got the rack, and I got a bench from uh, Jesse. Yeah. And we've got a, you know, the bars that we need. So. Right. Then I would build me a deadlift platform, and that's really all you need right now. I mean. You're talking bare bones essentials, yeah. But then um, from there, you know, I would probably, well, you could even do it in the power rack too, shoulder presses. Um, and then I would start working on dumbbell sets. Dumbbells are really important. They're really universal for a lot of things. So once you get the power rack, the bench press, the deadlift platform, dumbbells, that would be my next purchase. All right. Thank you. Yep. Got time for one more question? Okay. Uh, this question's for Frank. With your popularity, do you find it difficult to uh, train uh, gyms, especially at like peak times, uh, where a lot of guys will know you and approach you, you know, to do a workout? Um, sometimes, I guess, yeah, even in my own gym, like, um, I go a certain time of day, time every day, and when I go at different times, someone can say, oh, I can't, I didn't know you worked out here, and I've been working out here for, you know, nine years. <laughs> and, um... You know, not I'm not I'm pretty think I'm pretty nice to everybody. Like you know, understanding is so, oh cool. You know, hey, nice to meet you and stuff like that. But I've gotten people like you know, right in the middle of a set or right you know, I, I mean, when I'm training by myself, I pretty much I've got my music on and everyone knows you're in your your zone and stuff like that. And as soon as someone starts to come talk to you and you know, I've had guys come to me and it's like I had my gym bag open and like I had you know something in there and they like open up my bag and looking at it and taking it out and looking at it and just grabbing it and like. You know, I don't know, just, and then my mind's just totally off training now. I'm just like, okay, what's this guy doing? You know, even just to talk to you, you know, I mean, there, some guy goes, comes up to me and says, you know, I don't, I, even to happen today, not today, yesterday, I was eating. That's the same as the gym, eating too. Uh, you know, I don't want to bother you, but kind of, you know, and I'm eating. I had a French fry in my mouth. You know, and, and French it's, fry. French fry. yeah, French fries. <laughs> I do. Potato, carbs. <laughs> uh, tasty carbs. Um, you know, and they I don't. Were, they were baked sweet potato fries. Yeah, I guess you'd say. <laughs> sure, you were. Um, I wouldn't. I don't think I would ever bother anybody in the middle of a workout. Maybe just hey, well that's fine. When you start talking to someone right in the middle of a workout, I mean, I I get kind of frustrated because like I I really like to be in my zone. I'm sure we all do when we're training and stuff. You know, I got a training partner. Sometimes we don't even speak. You know, we don't speak at all. Yeah, okay. More, more weight. <laughs> You know, so um, I don't know, maybe people, 
I, I don't want to be mean. I've never been mean to someone and say no or whatever, but like, it's hard not to get frustrated with people and stuff. You know, even going to other countries, I've been a lot of different countries too, and like, um, the fans are amazing, the best in the world, but sometimes they just like, they can't wait, you know, to get in there right away. You know, you, you, you're just putting the weight down and just they're grabbing you for a picture or just to say hi or shake your hand. So, but it, it's a great feeling, don't get me wrong, but um, especially when you're training for a show or like not away at an event, like say like, you know, the Arnold and stuff like that, I understand, because people come here to see you, so it's expected. But when you're in your hometown or, you know, whatever, and you're trying to train, it's, it can get a little frustrating. But, you know, I just uh, try to be nice as, as I can. I want to ask Frank, uh, this is something that I think a lot of people wonder about. You know, we all know that supplementation plays a large part in uh, in powerlifting and bodybuilding. But the diet factor, I mean, you know, for a, for a professional-level bodybuilder, I'll, I'll give you the example. Boris Shako, one of the when I was down in Australia, I was talking to him about the supplementation side, and his his exact quote to me was, he was Kirill Sarachev, who's bench pressed 700 pounds raw, is sitting over there, and uh, I was talking to him. I said, you know, what is your view on supplementation? He said the best supplement is food. You know, he said, Kirill. Well, he said while we've been talking, Kirill's had a quart of milk and two plates of food, and. Um, I think a lot of people really, they miss that aspect of the sport. You know, they miss that understanding that supplement. You look at the definition of what that is. That's an assistance to, that's an aid to the foundation. And while supplements play a very important role, you know, when I, when I actually came on board with Animal, um, I had very, very little supplement use, very little supplement knowledge um, as far as, like, for myself. So... I didn't realize how easy it was just to get 50 grams of protein from a shake. I mean, I did, but I just didn't do it. You know what I mean? I was, I grew up in a house where my dad thought uh, whey protein was steroids. I swear. My mom did too. Yeah, when I was when I was 17 years old, I came home with, uh, I went to the health food store to get you this. I got creatine, HMB, and uh, uh, whey protein from the health food store. It's probably the worst brand you could ever like. Bobby like Bobby James protein or something like that. You know what I'm saying? So. I come home with this stuff and I set it on the counter, kind of like just slid it in the back. And my dad was like, Come here. And you'd have to know my dad. He has a way with words. He said, What is this shit? <laughs> and I said, Well, this is, uh, is going to help me in the gym. And he said, I'll show you what it's going to help you do. So it's going to help you clean the dishes. So he, puts the, he poured the protein powder over all the dirty dishes, poured the creatine all over the dirty dishes and the HMB, and he said, Now wash them. So that was it. I mean, so when I, when I came on board, you know, I was just, I was a big believer in just whole food. That was my whole thing, and I think that's important. But for you as a pro bodybuilder and somebody who's, who's you know, just a good dude, um, what is your take on it? I mean, how important is whole food to you, and how important is is it to like really stick to your meals? Um, you know what? I, I can I go kind of the same as you. My mom, when I when I bought stuff too, she freaked out. Um, but my not my dad. My dad loved it. He said, "Take whatever you got to take." <laughs> he, and he'd watch me work out. He'd get his friends come down, watch him on chicken bench, you know. Um, and I, yeah, I, well, I, was, I was 17 years old. and I could do like 300 pounds, and they thought that I was like Superman, you know. Um, yeah, no, whole food is definitely more important than anything like, to me personally. Um, I've I've had stomach issues in the past. Like when I was young, I could eat anything. You know, I could eat this table. If you told me it was going to make me bigger, I'd eat this table. And over the years, um, you know, my stomach's gotten a little, um, you know, I did the force feed, you know, drinking uh, bottles of Diet Coke a day. You know, I kind of did a number on my stomach and kind of, I'm kind of away from all that kind of stuff now. And um, uh, I couldn't eat for a while. And I noticed that, you know, I got smaller. I was taking, you know, lots of supplements, but I, when, you, when I couldn't eat, Strength would go down, size would be down, <clears throat> and as soon as I, you know, fixed my problem, my stomach, and I started eating, everything just started to get better. You know, um, nothing's going to replace, you know, food and meals uh, for sure. But you know, supplements help. Don't get me wrong. But even when I take my shakes and stuff, I'm eating food with it. Like I'm making um, shakes and oatmeal and bananas together, obviously. Um, but um, you know, if you can't get the food in, you can't eat the meals every day. You know, you can take whatever you want. It's not gonna, it's not gonna help. It's not gonna work. Well, for me personally, it's not. For me, it doesn't work. If I'm not eating, it's, it's not, not, not gonna happen. So you're, how much do you weigh? How much do I weigh? 
Well, I look bigger than you and you, you weigh your heavier, so. You need X amount of calories to keep that Yeah, you know, people ask me macros and all that kind of stuff. I don't, I don't know that. I just, every meal I try to have a certain amount every meal. Like, say I try to have 50 grams of protein and 100 grams of carbs, you know. Because you were shooting for 5,000 calories. There's no way you can get it because protein shit. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember right. uh, Trevor Smith? Remember the stuff he used to say? Yeah. You know, like, mix half a jug of protein in a gallon. Right. I've done that stuff. I drink, it all day. I drink it all day long, you know. I've done that crap. Has anybody ever heard of hot stuff? Yeah. Yeah. You remember hot stuff? I remember. You know what it said on the bottle? Remember? It's like taking 50 pills in one glass. Yeah. That's the first thing I ever had. And I drank it. It was rumored that there was some funny stuff in there. I will say this. For powerlifters, the one thing that I... I argue with people so many times. You're not trying to you're not trying to win a pose down. So eat the calories. Calories are fuel. Calories make you strong. Um, yeah, I mean, I promise you. I promise you. If you stop counting the macros and you just trust the mirror, that's what I've always tried to do the most of. Eat your protein first. Eat your fat second, and then just get full as hell on carbs. You know, and that's. And if you start getting fat, eat a little more protein, eat a little more fat, and cut back the carbs. You know, and to be 335 pounds, I'm not going to get full eating six ounces of chicken breast, you know what I mean? <laughs> and a protein shake, you know. Um, there are ways to make food taste good, and that's one of the things, uh, the guy that I work with on my nutrition, he said, if it doesn't taste good, you're not going to eat it. So he taught me a lot about using spices. He taught me a lot about using potassium chloride versus sodium chloride for salt. Um... You know, and things like, you know, I watch a lot of stuff that uh, Antoine posts and, and Frank posted the the pro and oats, uh, the cinnamon roll with oatmeal and a scoop of peanut butter. If you can eat that and not like it as a dietary food, you're an idiot. I mean, that's like the best tasting thing in the world. I eat it four or five days a week, you know. Just whenever I'm hungry, I'll have it because it's awesome. It's carbs, fat, and protein. And um, the pro and oats. It's a, it's a scoop of the uh, cinnamon, is it cinnamon roll? Yep. Yeah, it's cinnamon roll, uh, protein, and oats. Yeah. And a, one cup of oats, and then a big, I mean, I probably get like four tablespoons of, of peanut butter. But it's just, you just cook the oatmeal first, leave it kind of watery, add in the pro and oats and stir in the, the peanut butter. It's probably one of the best, like, just take with you snacks you can have. It's awesome. And if you get it cold, you can actually make bars out of it. Um, it's something that I've kind of not really done very much I did it on accident you know but it was um things like that just having fun with your supplementation and your food is is the best way to do it I mean because if you I mean I've done the dry listen when I did a bodybuilding show I took dry chicken breast and broccoli to Outback and had the person I was with order what I wanted to get just so I could smell it so I could eat the dry chicken breast and broccoli you know what I mean I've been that dude it's not that serious you know what I mean (laughs) Like I say, even, even me, like I've learned that I've trained a few people too, and I see them eating in the off season chicken and broccoli rice plain. I'm like, guys, you don't have to do that. Like, tor- it's torture. Trust me, I've been there, I've done it all. And like, I'll make the same meal, but I'll make, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys have any. Do you guys have shake and bake? Shake and bake? Yeah. I'm, I'm big on shake and bake right now. <laughs> like, dude, I'm, twice a day, I'm eating shake and bake and mashed potato. And I, I eat it. Like, I, I, some of <laughs> like I'm making this stuff and I'm making it taste good. Yeah. And you get still, you know, protein, uh, you know, carbs, you know, it's a little more sodium, maybe a little more fat, whatever. I'm in my off season and as uh, long as I'm not getting too out of shape, it's fine. So I mean and I'm I'm my appetite's not the not the biggest now, but especially when eating something I'm not crazy about. Oh, I can do it. I'm I'm a good cook. I'm a good cook. But I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll make so much, and it's too much, and I'll keep eating, I'll get sick, but it's so good, I'll keep, I, I want to keep eating. Um, yeah, it's crazy. But anyway, you don't have to be like this chicken and broccoli all day. Like, that's just crazy. That's nonsense. My favorite is, the, and I hate to knock on these people, because they're, they're good-hearted people, and I've done the same things. Like I said, I would go to Outback, and I would have my little Tupperware thing. I was talking to a guy in line down here at the cage, and he's, like, sitting there eating his rice and, like, 2.3 ounces of chicken breast, and I'm like... <laughs> Dude, it's it's not that it's not that serious, man. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's like you gotta enjoy this. I mean, yeah, there are days you're gonna suffer, no matter what your goal is, whether it's pure strength or, or pure look. 
but if you're not enjoying it, I mean, because I think we've all probably done it to the point where we've been miserable doing it. Well, I think people are going to quit if they check this out. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing is you have to realize you have to fit this into your life, and it, it becomes a lifestyle. And, you know, there are, part, there are days, like I said, when you're going to eat out of the Tupperware and things like that. But overall, if you're not enjoying it, if it becomes more of a labor than a love, you're screwed. I mean, it, it, and I've gotten there many times. And you, that's when you get, that's when you experience the burnout. You're more likely to skip gym days. You're more likely to get injured just because you don't want to do it. It's not fun anymore. So as long as you uh, keep it real and, and realize it's not the end of the world if you have that cheeseburger or you have that extra scoop of ice cream or whatever, you know, you're gonna, you're, there's going to be another day. So. Double cheeseburger. Double cheeseburger. Yeah, bacon. Oh, oops. We want to thank you guys for coming, and I want to thank uh, Frank, Brandon, and Andre for giving us their time. And uh, if you guys want to come up and get an autograph or a picture, you're more than welcome to do that. Is that how you got the form by doing that? Exactly. <laughs> 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 I'm going to go do Thank you very much. Yeah, I can do my toes, too. I can throw some gauges. Thanks for the Oh, did you? Yeah. How many spokes? 100 spokes? 86. 86. 86. 86.